I'm really excited to introduce to you our new book, Rose's Ice Cream Bliss. Its pub date is July 7th, and this will be the first video that we've done to promote it and to show you how we make the basic ice cream and various big breakthrough techniques and tips. Um, we have to address first why it's worth making your own ice cream. And that's because when you make your own ice cream, you can use the best quality ingredients. You don't have to add any stabilizers, which always compromise the texture and even the flavor. And you have very low overrun. Overrun is the amount of air that's churned into the ice cream when it's made. And this way, it's a, a, around 27% for most of the ice creams in this book. It's dense and it's really delicious. The main goal in making ice cream creamy and smooth is to have small ice crystals. And one of the ways to do it is to have a high amount of yolk and a high ratio of cream to milk. In other words, a lot of fat and very little liquid in the form of water. Now you wonder what we do with all those egg whites. There are a few things in the book that are really great. We'll get to in a moment about ice creams that can be made without an ice cream machine that use egg white. But my favorite ice cream in the whole book is one that's made with lemon curd on the inside, but the meringue shell is made with egg white, with Italian meringue. And I call it the upside down lemon meringue pie. There are three basic techniques in this book that I use for getting to my goal. One is to concentrate the liquids. And when I use it for berries, for example, I freeze the berries and then I press out as much of the juices that I can. So the pulp never gets cooked and stays fresh. And then I've actually designed a reduction spatula because it's silicone. And whenever a recipe says reduce something by a quarter or by a third, you don't know without pouring it out and pouring it back. This way, you can just stick it in, see what mark it comes to. It's just a raised mark. You can even do it in the microwave, and it doesn't require stirring. You know how sometimes in a microwave, the fluid just bursts out of the container. It won't happen with that. It won't coat your microwave with the juices. So usually I reduce liquids to a quarter to one third of what it was originally. Um, I do that with not only berries, but with pomegranate juices. And the, that technique is also used in, in conjunction with cornstarch, which is another method. For example, when you're making mango ice cream, mango, you don't want to cook at all. You don't get any juices from it. So then the, the, the other method is by using the cornstarch. But with the berries, I use cornstarch, I make a slurry, and that absorbs the liquid. So that's what keeps it from forming ice crystals. The third method is dry milk, The cooking it with some of the milk. It bonds with the fat and the water and keeps it also from forming crystals. So these are the three basic methods that are used. And now we'll start the demo with chocolate ice cream, which is one of my favorites. These are the mise en place that I started with. And this is, of course, is cocoa. The chocolate's going to go in at the end because chocolate is best just melted and not heated any further. This is a, a new cocoa I've discovered called Cocoa Berry Extra Brut, which uh, you can use any unsweetened cocoa, preferably Dutch processed. But I'm trying this out for the first time in ice cream. I've used other types that are really excellent. And, of course, sugar and a tiny touch of dry instant espresso. That's the dark brown here and salt. I use fine sea salt and malt, which is, um, and this is a surprise because it's used for malted milk. I don't like the flavor of malt, but in chocolate, it really, you don't taste malty. You just taste a more rounded, delicious chocolate. So this is our mise that we start off with. I use, I keep all my things in bins. You can see this is the sugar. My salt is in a surgical dressing jar, and that way I can measure it more easily. I don't weigh salt, but I weigh just about everything else. When there's small ingredients, I don't weigh. This, of course, is just in um, refrigerated. And then the cocoa I also put into bins. Now I'm just going to stir together all these ingredients because they're going to be added to the egg yolk and the glucose. Glucose is another secret weapon of creating really smooth and creamy ice cream, which is also what I call scoopable. It makes it easier to scoop. And one of the things I used to use in the past was alcohol of some sort, like a liqueur, because it's like antifreeze. 
But the problem is that when it starts melting, it sort of thins out, whereas the glucose has a really good consistency. So when even when the ice cream is melting, you get that full richness on the palate. So it doesn't have to be completely, I mean, I just combine it. The cocoa will be in little particles, but that's going to dissolve in the egg yolk mixture. So this is six egg yolks, and actually sometimes you may have to use nine to get the rice weight, right, waste, weight, because egg yolks are often smaller, the laying chickens are younger, and so it's best to weigh or at least to measure. And I usually use put in the glucose after I put everything else in, if it's cold, because I keep it in the refrigerator. In fact, I keep it in one of these squeegee jars, containers, and it's so great because you can easily dispense it. If it gets too cold and I forget to take it at room temperature, I just put it in the microwave for maybe seven seconds, and then it's easy to pour. So um, that's what I was saying, is that if it's too cold, it's, it's hard to get everything to mix in evenly. Okay, now I'll ask, as soon as the egg yolk is completely coated, and it's fine to, to stir it with the glucose, but I never would stir it together with the sugar first because the sugar cooks the yolk, it makes it crusty. And you don't have to worry about that colliza, that ropey little white attachment between the yolk and the white because this is going to be strained. The ice cream base always gets strained so that any little particles get removed. And part of the reason that you strain it is that... Uh, you don't have to worry about those particles, and also it makes it as smooth as possible, which is the goal in ice cream. Okay, so here comes all the moisture. You can use a whisk, but I found there was really no need. Um, I'm using an induction burner. This is the Breville. I think it's called Burner with a Brain, or is that the oven? <laughs> Either way, it's really marvelous. Wait until you hear it go on. So as soon as this is completely melted, not melted, rather, but evenly incorporated. I add the cream and the milk. And this is one of the important things in my personal technique that I found works best. Whenever you heat cream or process dairy, it always compromises the flavor a little. And now that we have ultra pasteurized milk and cream mostly that's available, there's no reason to have to have it really hot uh, when you add it. But, and also the yolk, there's no reason to temper yolk because the yolk's gonna come up to 170, 180. So when you bring it together with all the other ingredients and you bring it to that temperature, it, there's no reason that you have to first temper it to be shocked by hot ingredients. And that saves a lot of time and really is a very good technique to use. So what I've done here is I'm using two and a half cups of cream total and a half a cup of milk. So I will stir the milk in. If I forget which is which, the milk is the whiter one. Cream has that yellow, quite ivory color from the, um, from the butter fat. What else? Okay. And then I'm stirring in the half cup of the heavy cream. And the rest of the cream is going to go in cold. So not only does it have a better flavor, but because it's cold, we don't have to worry about putting it in the refrigerator right away. Otherwise, you have to put it in a water bath, an ice bath to cool it down. I mean, it wouldn't hurt the ice cream, but it would heat up everything in your freezer. All right, refrigerator, right? We're not to freezing yet. So temperature is so important in making ice cream. I think it's probably the most critical thing from the heat that you want for the base to keeping everything very cold to have small ice crystals. So now that this is now a smooth consistency, I can turn it on and start heating. And I have ready here the container I'm gonna pour it into and store it into. This has the chopped chocolate, it should be pretty finely chopped, otherwise it won't melt. And when it doesn't, then you have little speckles of chocolate in the, uh, in the frozen ice cream, which is not an altogether bad thing. So listen to this lovely little sound. Isn't that enchanting? <laughs> it's like even better than Tinkerbell. Oh, but I better bring up the heat. Okay, so I can bring this, since it's ultimately gonna be no higher than 180, um, I can bring it to, it won't be 180, but um, right away, so we have time and I'll start it warmer. But the thing is that you, you may wonder, well, why do you worry about the temperature of the ice cream base when it's going to be frozen anyway? 
And one of the things, if this has ever happened to you, that you've made lemon, well, not lemon meringue, because that's, the lemon meringue filling is brought to a boil because the egg yolks are protected by the acidity and the cornstarch, otherwise they'll curdle. But um, you know what I'm going to use is, as I get close, so I don't have to hold my instant read thermometer, I'll just use my point and shoot, and that way I'll see how close I am. So what was I saying about, um, oh yeah, about why you would not want it to be under 160 at the, at the lowest part of the finished temperature, because if it's ever happened to you that you made a custard filling and it was beautiful the day you made it and the next day it was watery, there's an enzyme in yolk called amylase, and if it doesn't reach over 160, it will reverse the thickening of the egg yolk and thin out the mixture. So, as I was saying, you may wonder why if it's frozen it matters, but ice cream isn't just eaten frozen, it's eaten as it's melting. And that's the beauty of it, that you want it to have a really thick, wonderful consistency, not cloying, but creamy. And that's how you get it, and the closest you can get to 180, the better it is, but if it's 170, you just fine, 175, just don't risk it, because most custard bases should not be over 180. I can think of one exception right off the bat, and that is, of course, the curds, because there's so much acidity, especially in a lemon curd, that you wouldn't want, um, you, you wouldn't have to worry as much about it being over 180. In fact, I think it has to be more like 195 or even 198. So here we are with the instant read. You can see it's not quite there yet. Now, the induction burner has a probe, so if I wanted to attach it, it would just stop when it's heated to that right temperature. But with the, this, this temperature is just at the base, so that, therefore I can bring it higher. 130, it goes fairly quickly. And meantime, it will give me the opportunity to tell you some of the breakthrough tips that I've found by making ice cream every day for months and months. For the Italian meringue, for two of the ice creams, when you bring the sugar syrup to about 230 degrees, and you beat it into the egg whites, you get this amazing consistency. Then you don't use an ice cream machine, you just freeze it. You don't have to churn it. In fact, you don't churn it. And not only is it a wonderfully ice-free ice cream, but it also happens to keep for, instead of the usual three days in the freezer, it will keep for several weeks without getting crystalline. So there are two ice creams in the book that use that. One is the lemon, um, the ginger lime, no, not ginger lime, ginger lemon ice cream, and the other one is nougat. And that, those are the things, if you don't have an ice cream machine right away, those are the ones that would be really good to start with. Okay, we're now at 150, and I'll give you another great tip. Well, first of all, lemon curd and orange curd, the different kind of curds, um, make a really wonderful ice cream, but um, they're, they're really easy to make ice cream because after you make the curd, you just have to add cream and a little milk and a little sugar. It's as simple as that. You don't make another custard. There are some wonderful concentrates. For example, a perfect puree of Napa Valley makes a, a concentrated... Um, blood orange that, and passion ice cream that, so you don't have to worry about concentrating down your juices. It's done for you. Um, see this? Oh, the dark brown sugar. I love the dark brown sugar ice cream, but dark brown sugar, I discovered, cur actually curdles the milk proteins. So instead of adding the milk and a little bit of the cream from the beginning, I add the cream and add the milk at the end because with the heavy cream, the fat protects it from curdling. Here's a really exciting thing I found. You can see I'm using a nonstick pan. I think you can see that. And I try to use nonstick pans because I don't lose any of my base. But when I'm making caramel, caramel usually will stick terribly if it's not a nonstick pan. You'll lose a good part of it. The sugar syrup for Italian meringue. Now, you can't use this tip for Italian meringue because there you don't want even a tiny trace of fat to get into the egg white. But you can use it for caramel. You can spray pan onto the inside of the pan, and then it won't stick to, when making the caramel, it won't stick. 162, we're now in the safe zone, but since I'm going to enjoy eating this, I want to bring it up higher, so I want it to be the best it can possibly be. Now here's something else that is in the book that's very special, and I've, I've actually developed this recipe several books back, but somehow it didn't seem like the right place for it. I call it the golden angel. It's made with angel food cake, but 
the angel food cake, the sugar for it, is made into caramel and then powdered. And then it sits with the egg white until it dissolves. And then just beaten like crazy. And it makes the most gorgeous angel food cake. And it's filled with either coffee. I think caramel is going to be a little over the top to have caramel and caramel. But it's, um, it's filled with either coffee ice cream, like a tunnel of love cake, or did I say coffee? Or vanilla, of course, is really good. Many different ice creams would go with that. We're almost there. Now, the thing is that when you get really close to 180, you want to get it right off the heat. So I have my strainer ready. I like to use a fine, very fine strainer, but you can just use any strainer that you have on hand is better than not straining at all. Okay, if I stir quickly, then it, it goes more slowly, you know, because it's cooling it down. But as I talk faster, I speed up my stirring. So, okay, we're, I'm going to stir more, more slowly and take a peek at my list of all the important things. Oh, yes, my favorite ice creams. Okay, the, the top favorite is the upside down lemon meringue pie. I also adore the black raspberry so much that we planted about 20 black raspberry bushes to always have plenty on hand and berries freeze really beautifully for at least a year. So we have last year's vintage. Okay, this is 170. The white chocolate, sheer, I call it sheer bliss. It's the only ice cream named after the, the book itself. It has gold leaf and it was a gift, the recipe from really dear friend and colleague, Lisa Yokelson. And it's one of the, my favorite pictures in the book too. Matthew Septimus who did the pictures for Baking Basics, and Erin McDowell, who's a really gifted baker, food stylist. She has a book coming out that's going to be pie in the fall, so we're planning to do pie a la mode, pairing my favorite ice creams with her favorite pies. That would be fun. Oh, and the mango lassie. That, if you make mango ice cream and put, the, uh, put some of it into the mango lassie and then a little ball of it on the top, that is the most ultimate flavored mango. Oh my goodness, my mouth is watering talking about these ice creams. I've not been able to make ice cream for a while because getting cream right now has been somewhat difficult and I've really missed it. So I cannot wait until this chocolate ice cream is finished, which brings to mind the most important thing about chilling ice cream is that you have to keep everything really cold. It's ideal to let the ice cream they sit overnight in the refrigerator for at least eight hours, up to 24, that's fine, or even two days. And then to chill the container, which is going to be churned, so that everything is as cold as possible when it starts. I like making pint-sized ice creams, but quart will work. It's just smaller, seems to have all the better consistency. Oh, 175. Okay, when I run out of tips and things to share, I'll strain it, okay? Okay. <laughs> I think there are about 100 recipes for ice cream. I kept adding more as I tried more and more things. I'm smelling the chocolate, and this doesn't even have the chocolate in it yet. The last thing to go in is vanilla so that I don't lose any of its qualities from ev evaporation. And then, as I said, because I'll be putting the cold cream in it next, which is sitting in the refrigerator now, I'll be able to refrigerate it right away. And another thing that when you freeze the ice cream, I always put a piece of plastic wrap on the top so I can make sure that it doesn't form ice crystals from condensation. But, you know, in the freezer, now that we are blessed with having self-defrosting refrigerators, it's also a curse for ice cream and various other things because defrost, partial defrosting takes place, then it refreezes and ice crystals grow larger. So what I do is I wrap the ice cream in one of these sleeves that are designed to chill down champagne or wine, or I surround it with other cold things, or frozen things, and that way it stays longer. Aha! 178, we're there. In we go. And of course, it's very dark because when we add two cups of heavy cream, it's going to lighten it considerably. And you see how it's so easy when you have a nonstick lining to get out as much as you can. I'm not actually concentrating any liquid here, but the spatula works so well I use it even when I'm not trying to reduce anything. Okay, that will be pretty good. I'll wash that out with some cream. 
Now you can see how much of the residue is left from the yolk. See this little colliza and push it through. And then I have to use a clean spatula to scrape out off the bottom, which is right over there, okay? Because I don't want to scrape more of this gunk, which I will eat, by the way, <laughs> into the ice cream. Okay, thank you. Woody is the cameraman here. See how I'm, I'm scraping off the bottom? And then I can use the new clean spatula to stir the rest of the heavy cream and the vanilla after it's cooled down. Okay, that's good enough. So would you please get me the two cups of the heavy cream, which I weighed out. Mm -hmm. There we are. Thank you. And speaking of heavy cream, if you look on the side of the container, and it says five grams of fat. It's not as heavy a cream as when it says six grams of fat. And I try to find so six grams because the high fat is really good for this. I mean, I'm into small portions, but exquisite taste and, and texture. And let's see, where is this on the, on the, here it is. We see it says six grams of fat. This is Organic Valley, which is my favorite. Stony Field, is that the other one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that also has six. I have not been able to find other, but other brands that have the right, or the highest quantity. It will still be really good with five, but as I said, I'm hedging my bets here trying to get the most ice-free ice cream. <laughs> so here it comes. You know, my favorite thing to bake, which is not, of course, cold, <laughs> is bread, but the, my favorite thing to eat is ice cream, and that's how this book came about. And of course, when it spins, it's going to change color too. Churning and spinning are two terms that are used interchangeably. It will get actually darker because I don't have that much air going into it when I churn. Um, okay. I also put my vanilla in the container. It's a teaspoon of vanilla to squeeze out because otherwise I sometimes end up getting a tablespoon when I really meant, meant to have a teaspoon. Now, of course, there's vanilla and all good chocolate, but nothing wrong with adding a really good vanilla, such as, let's see, well, of course, I love Nielsen Massey and the, the vanilla from uh, Patricia Rains, the Vanilla Queen, and the one from Hawaii, Halila, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. And the, the chocolate that we used is Valrhona 61%. Godiva is also uh, Ghirardelli. Godiva, rather. It's not Godiva. What am I saying? Guitard. <laughs> Guitard is another real favorite. I think it's 62%. It doesn't have to be exactly 61, but the higher the percentage of cacao, the less the sugar, and so it's slightly less sweet. Although from one percentage to the other, it probably wouldn't make any difference. But also a uh, higher percentage of cacao would be also slightly thicker. So this is it. Now we're going to cover it with plastic wrap because whenever you put something in the refrigerator, even if it's reserved for sweets, it still can absorb other odors, especially anything with dairy. So this will now go in. This is my ice cream base, the chocolate ice cream that I made yesterday that has been sitting in the refrigerator overnight. And I always whisk it first to make sure that, it, that anything that's settled to the bottom is evenly dispersed, although the batten will certainly do the job as well. So I'm going to be pouring it into the Breville. I have, these are my two favorite machines that I use for testing all the recipes. And I use the Cuisine Art one when I'm making a quart. I use the Breville when I'm making a pint, which is a half quart. They each do a better job given the, the quantities. So the, one of the critical things is that the ice cream be cold and that we pre-chill containers. And these have their own refrigerants, which means that you don't have to store them in the freezer overnight to get them cold enough. But if you have the type of machine that you have to do that with, make sure it's a good 24 hours because otherwise it won't be cold enough to freeze the ice cream. So. I can just stop, pause the machine, and pour it in. 
You can see the gorgeous consistency. And for, a, it really is pretty quick, for 15 minutes. The faster it is, the smaller the crystals. And I'm um, talking about the ice crystals. You want ice crystals, but you want them to be really little so that you can hardly perceive them on the tongue. And it's just a smooth, creamy ice cream. Okay, I get to lick the bowl. And scrape every last bit in. And now start, and you can see that I have it in the hardest because I find that's the best consistency and it still is going to need a good hour or two in the freezer to ripen and have perfect consistency. And that's it. Well, the ice cream is churned, and now the first step, which I didn't even put in the book, so it's great to be able to show you this, is that while it's still in the machine, I will actually scrape it off the batten. This is the batten that's churning it, and that way it keeps it super cold. Look at this texture. Oh, my God. You know, the hardest part is waiting the eight hours or overnight and now waiting another one or two hours. But, of course, we get to lick the batten, so we have a preview of how wonderful it's going to be. So as soon as I can get all of this off, I can move this out. And I like to work in the coldest spot of the house, which is the garage, which is right next door to the ice cream machine. So this is our baking kitchen. And as soon as I can transfer this to a colder spot, I will put it into the container that's chilled so that it keeps everything frozen. This is why I love making ice cream in the winter. I mean, people think of ice cream eating it all year round, but somehow they think of making it on the back porch in the summer, and it's a nice tradition, but you have to get the ice and the rock salt and one of those old-fashioned machines. And I kind of like the modern way of doing it. It's, well, of course, it's a lot less work to do. And you're not, you're not using muscle power. Maybe that compensates for the calories, you know, that you, you go to all that effort of making the, churning the ice cream and appreciate it even more, although that's not possible because I so love it. I can't imagine it being any better. Anyhow, um, at the, I also like to scrape it off the sides because that's where it's the coldest. And you can see how cold this is. I don't think it shows, but it's like minus 30 so inside the machine. So this is why it keeps the ice cream so beautifully cold. See, it does. you can not have to rush at this point because it's going up against the cold sides and it's not going to be starting to melt. But once you want to take it out of the container, that's when you want to be as quick as possible, which is why I like making smaller quantities of ice cream. And either of these machines, you can make one batch after another. So I think I would go for this, the smaller amount rather than the larger amount, unless I'm doing an ice cream party and people are waiting anxiously to get their ice cream. Wait until you see my device that I've picked up to keep things cold. Now you can just surround your bowl in a, another bowl of ice, and if you I sprinkle some salt on it, will even stay colder. But my little container for the half pint, for the pint, um, fits perfectly into, this is a Donvier, one of the, mm -hmm. and it's still available, um, manual ice cream machines. This is the canister that you have to freeze thoroughly before churning the ice cream. But I no longer use it to churn ice cream. I use it to keep it cold. Mm -hmm. So here it is, ready to go, ready to be transferred. I'm going to try not to eat it while I'm doing it. But see how it still has a beautiful consistency and it's not beginning to melt. So I'm going to put it into this container until I get it all in. And that we can actually eat it now. It's, it's kind of soft serve, a little bit firmer. But it's even better if you let it sit freezer for what is called ripening. There we go. It's going to come so it just goes in the freezer the for how long? Um, at least an hour. I like to do two hours, but it depends on the temperature of your freezer. My freezer is pretty cold, so I would say if it's not a super cold freezer, definitely go for the two hours or check it every once in a while. And the best way to check it is to take a spoonful of it and see if it's the consistency that you want. So soon you'll be getting to see us scooping ice cream. And here it is, an hour and a half later, and you'll see the consistency of the ice cream. Now, I could just lift it out completely with a foil with a plastic wrap 
but since it's still a tiny bit scoopable, I might as well just keep it in here to keep it. I mean, it would probably sit like this for an hour at room temperature. That's how great this freezing container is, the Don Vier. Anyhow, here's the plastic wrap. I'm removing it, and I have a choice of three different scoops. The first one is the one that Erin gave me after our, and actually it was at the beginning of our food styling shoot. We had several of them, and she had this one made for me, and I was so thrilled. But Erin McDowell? I know. Yes, Erin McDowell, who is a cookbook author of an upcoming pie book, and she has also written The Fearless Baker, and she was the stylist for the ice cream shoot, which she said was the hardest she ever did. I mean, imagine keeping all of those ice cream bowls without melting. <laughs> you know, it was very cold in that room. I wore five layers of clothes. Anyhow, I'm ready to eat this, so I'm going to start scooping. Oh, but this is the one that I use. It has the antifreeze if it's really hard, because as you can see, my hand is not that big and strong. And this is the one that I really love the best, which I'm going to use now. And this is what Aaron gave me when we finished the shoot. It's beautifully weighted, and it makes the most beautiful rounded scoops. So uh, let me scoop out the first one. This one's waiting for Woody after we finish his videoing. <laughs> You can see it's a little softer in the middle, but around the edges is where it's always the firmest, and I just can't wait any longer. Although normally I would wait two hours. I like somewhat soft serve. Here we go. One perfect scoop. That's not to say I'm not going to have more. <laughs> and, and this um, little spoon comes from the Mayfair Hotel in New York from the early 1900s. My grandmother was a seamstress there. I think she must have swiped it. But anyway, it's a little treasure. It's silver plate. And I love eating small little bits of ice cream with it to make it last longer. Okay. Now, if I waited another half hour or so, it would be so hard I would not be able to scoop it without letting it sit for about 20 minutes or in the refrigerator. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad at all? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have to say, this is my favorite chocolate ice cream. As I mentioned in the beginning when making the base, it's a little bit of malt that gives it the extra chocolatey, rounded flavor. The wonderful quality chocolate, 61%, and the best Dutch processed cocoa, unsweetened cocoa that all oh, that conspires, and eggs, of course, and heavy cream and milk. A pinch of salt and lots of love. <laughs>